So I wanted to make a comparative analysis of the destruction of the Yadu dynasty and the destruction of Iskan, because I believe that there are some parallel psychologies. The Yadu dynasty were helping Krishna when he was here. They were part of his family, and they were doing great service while he was here. But Krishna was very concerned that after he would leave, the Yadu dynasty would be arrogant and causing a lot of problems because they would be uh, overtaking the less powerful people. They would be powerful because they were connected to Krishna, but they would be misusing their power. So Krishna wanted to arrange that they would all have to depart <laughs> before they caused a lot of trouble for the earth. So they would, in other words, they would become a burden for the earth. And Krishna didn't want them to burden the earth. He didn't want his own family to be a burden. So uh, while Krishna was here, they were empowered by Krishna to do all kinds of things. Uh, because Krishna was here personally supervising and making them act appropriately, and he knew when he would leave, they would no longer follow his directives and they would be troublemakers. And a very similar thing happened in ISKCON. The ISKCON devotees were empowered by Prabhupada to do all kinds of things that they couldn't normally do. But after he would leave, they would still have a certain amount of power and Shakti by serving Prabhupada and Krishna, but they might misuse that power. It would be a problem. And Prabhupada was very concerned about that, so he mentioned that many, many times. Will the GBC spoil it after I am gone? And, I mean, only my books will remain. The temples might be destroyed. So he, he said things like that. So there were uh, many uh, like warnings from Prabhupada that after I leave, there will be a lot of chaos and problems. And uh, it's even mentioned in the story of me, the story of Paranjan. That's my name, Paranjan. <laughs> and in the story of Paranjan, uh, Prabhupada says, when the spiritual master departs, there's all kinds of problems because there's like a power vacuum. So when Krishna would depart, there would be also a power vacuum. So I'm just paraphrasing the story here that the, the Yadda dynasty was destroyed by fighting with iron-like reeds that were growing by the ocean. So how did this come about? There was a child in the family of the Yadus. His name was Samba. And him and his friends, they dressed up Samba as a woman and they tied an iron ball around her, his stomach to make it look like it was a pregnant woman. They put a sari on Samba and dressed him as a woman. He had the iron ball strapped to him so he looked like he was pregnant. He goes there to the sages, the very powerful sages, and they're trying to joke with these sages, which is not a good idea. <laughs> but that happens if you're arrogant. So there was already some arrogance there going on. So these children go there they, they challenge the sages. They say, we have a pregnant woman here. Can you tell us what the baby is going to be? And the sages, they uh, were not happy with this kind of joking. So they said, yes, this baby will be the destruction of the Yadu dynasty. So the children right away realized they made a big mistake. So they were mortified by that. They ran back to the elders and said, oh my gosh, the sages have said that this iron ball baby will be the destruction of the Yadu dynasty. So the adults became very alarmed by that and they ground the iron ball up into little slivers. They filed it down into little teeny weeny little pieces and they dumped all of the pieces by the ocean. And of course that is where the, the iron reeds came from. They sprouted out from those little slivers of iron pieces and became reeds that were hard as iron. So later, the Yadda dynasty came to that spot and they started arguing amongst themselves and they started beating each other 
with those iron rod reeds and they killed themselves. And Krishna was there also uh, helping the fight <laughs> because I think Krishna didn't want these people to be here and so he participated in helping eradicate them. Now it's also said that one of those reeds was filed into a uh, arrowhead and that arrowhead was the arrow which shot Krishna in the foot later on which supposedly caused Krishna's departure. But in any case the point is the Yadu dynasty people were becoming arrogant and they were becoming hedonistic. So in other words they were starting to go against Krishna's uh, standards and it goes against Krishna's wishes and so Krishna had to do something to fix that. But in ISKCON we had really nobody here to fix it. So after Prabhupada left we had a lot of arrogant behavior and hedonistic behavior. <laughs> Starting at the top of the totem pole with the leaders. The leaders of ISKCON became incredibly arrogant. They thought we are going to take Prabhupada's place. We're going to sit in Prabhupada's seat and we're going to be the new Prabhupada's. And one policeman told me there was Prabhupada and then there was the people who thought they were Prabhupada. <laughs> so they thought they were Prabhupada. They thought I'm going to put on a robe, I'm going to carry a danda, a stick, and act like I'm a sannyasi, I'm a guru by just putting on an external show. I'll put on the dress of a guru and I'll be a guru. And of course Sridhar Maharaj helped them along with that idea. Sridhar Maharaj said you put on the military uniform and that makes you a soldier. So you put on the dress of a guru that makes you a guru. Of course that never really works in real life. You can't just put a, a, a military uniform on an ordinary citizen and think he's going to behave and act like a soldier. He might, he might not. He needs to be trained. He needs to be qualified. So Prabhupada would say things like, has the GBC become more than Guru Maharaj? The GBC is not chanting their rounds. The GBC is not following. All these problems are happening because the leaders are not following. He, he would make statements like that on a regular basis. So he was very aware that there was a lot of motivation in that group. Motivation to become worshipped, uh, motivation to take over. Prabhupada said Jamal is just trying to take over my movement. I need to send him to China. He's simply causing a headache. I can't sleep at night because of all these plotting and scheming things that are going on around me. He said things like that. Of course he also said someone is giving me poison. So I do think that there were several layers to this arrogant plotting against Prabhupada. There was the uh, what I would call the inner core and these people were part of the plot to poison Prabhupada. So of course, again, very arrogant. I need to get rid of this person to take over. And that actually happens in real life. The children of a wealthy man, they might hire the nurse to put poison in the food of the elderly person so that they can get rid of the elderly person and take over his house. And I do believe that happened in ISKCON. And the reason that happened is because of arrogance and impudence. People thought we can get rid of Prabhupada and then we can take over. And it's going to be a piece of cake. It's going to be easy because it's going to be easy to become another Prabhupada. So Prabhupada is not very significant. And we are significant or we're more significant than he is. So how can we compare the beating over the head with iron rods of the destruction of the Kuru dynasty with ISKCON. And I would say that 
that happened on a subtle way uh, in ISKCON. For example, Satsvarupa, when he originally said he was going to be a guru, he didn't really want to sit in a Vyasa seat, a Vyasa san, you know, a guru seat. But Brahmananda led him up to the seat and said, no, you have to sit in this seat. Okay, how is that killing uh, one another with iron rods? Well, Prabhupada said, if we neophytes take sins, if we absorb sins, we will get sick, fall down, or worse. And he also says, people who take the post of guru without authority will eventually become degraded. So if I encourage somebody to do something that will cause him to get sick, fall down, and many of them died prematurely, I mean, it's a very severe uh, problem if you're taking sins without authority. Prabhupada said, though, you neophytes, if you absorb sins, you will suffer, you will fail, you will have all kinds of problems. So if I encourage someone to do that, I'm beating him over the head with an iron rod. <laughs> On a subtle way, at least. You know. So if I tell Satsarup, go ahead and sit in that seat, go ahead and take the sins of thousands of people and absorb their sins, I'm killing this person indirectly. I'm beating over the head with an iron rod in an indirect way. So a lot of people don't realize that, uh, but that is a fact. If I advise someone to do something that's going to cause him to destroy his life in different ways, I'm killing him indirectly. So that is one of the ways that so many lives were destroyed in ISKCON. Jayatirtha was the same way. He was falling down, he was having problems, and many God brothers just said, oh, we have to pray for Jayatirtha to be saved from this, we have to save Jayatirtha, we have to keep him in the guru seat. And uh, Sridhar Maharaj said the same thing, we have to keep Jayatirtha in the guru seat. Okay, well Jayatirtha is taking sins, and that means he's going to suffer, he's going to fall down, he's going to get sick, or he's going to die by taking sins. So if we're encouraging someone to do that, we're beating him over the head with an iron rod. We're hurting that person severely. And that's what happened. Jaitirtha went on taking sins and he just went crazy. He started selling designer drugs. He started telling his followers to take drugs. And uh, eventually he, he had his head chopped off because he was having illicit sex with a follower. So he was killed. So he was hurt. He was hurt badly because so many of my God brothers, they encouraged him to take that post. And when I told my God brothers, hey, we can't have Jayatirtha sitting in a big seat. We can't have him being a guru. Uh, they said, well, you're being offensive. Who are you? Who are you to criticize Prabhu? Uh, you know, you know, so I'm trying to save this guy's life and I'm the bad guy. <laughs> and Sasarub, he started getting headaches right away. Like a year after he became a guru, he had debilitating headaches. So he was suffering. He was suffering. So it's like somebody whacked him over the head with an iron pipe. His, his head is hurting. Hansaduda had headaches. Jagadish had headaches. And so on and so forth. So they're having a headache because they're getting beat over the head with an iron rod. But it's on a subtle platform. It's not immediately visible, so it doesn't appear as if that's what's going on. But that is what's going on. That person is being harmed, that person is being hurt, and that person is getting sick, falling down, and suffering. Because so many people are encouraging him to take this path. We want you to sit in this seat. We want you to absorb the sins of thousands of people. Okay, we want you to get sick fall down and die. That's what we want. We want you to fail. So it's the same as taking an iron rod and just whacking on this person. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, I think it is. I think that's the evidence. The evidence will show that all of my God brothers, not all of them, but a lot of them, I would say almost all of them, encouraged Jai Tirtha at a time when I was trying to discourage Jai Tirtha. And that was my point. I said, hey, he, he can't absorb sins. It's not going to work. 
He's going to sit in this seat. He's going to take all these sins, and this is going to cause problems for him and for the society as a, as a whole. Because as he fails and suffers, and he's the leader, then it's going to cause the society to fail and suffer. And it did. And then we have someone like Jai Pataka, another person who is suffering all kinds of physical maladies. Again, same problem. He's been encouraged by many of my God brothers to go ahead and sit in a big guru seat and take the sins of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And it's causing him to suffer. So he's getting sick, he's falling apart in so many ways. And even recently I saw a festival of Jai Pataka where a number of my god brothers, including like Janani Vas and Pankajangri and these guys, they're all smiling and laughing and clapping and thinking, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. We have our god brother sitting in a big seat, he's taking sins, and he's suffering like a dog. Isn't that wonderful? We're killing this guy. We're encouraging this guy to take sins. We're helping this guy go down the path of suffering. And it's a wonderful thing. Everybody's smiling, they're laughing, they're joking. They think it's, it's wonderful. No, it's not wonderful. You're hurting this person. You're killing this person. He's not supposed to take sins. Not. It's not possible for a neophyte to be able to absorb sins. Impossible. It never works. It causes suffering. And everybody's smiling and laughing and joking and clapping their hands. And, oh, isn't this nice? No, it's not. It's like a horror show. <laughs> That's what it is. You're causing suffering to others. And it looks like he got hit over the head with an iron pipe. He's got a big band-aid on the top of his head. He's wearing a mask. He's had all kinds of surgeries, he's, he's just a mess. Because so many people said, you go sit in the seat uh, without thinking of the consequences of that. So it's causing suffering for him and for the society. Because, the, you know, Jai Pataka is a leader of the society and as he fails and suffers and has problems, and he's the leader, then it's causing problems for the whole society, including people look at him and say, why do I want to become a pure devotee if this is the result of becoming a pure devotee? You have all these problems. You have headaches, you have suffering, you have fall downs, you have problems. It's just nothing but a headache to become a pure devotee. Why should I bother becoming a pure devotee? It's discouraging others from taking the path of Krishna consciousness. You know, and if we look at others like Bhagavan, for example, he was living in a five-star hotel in Paris when I, when I went there to visit, and he's just disconnected. He, he doesn't understand all the problems that are going on in ISKCON. He has no real connection to, you know, the, the, the peons that are suffering under him. And why is that? It's because everyone has encouraged him to take a post which he's not qualified to take and it's causing him to become disconnected from his real job, which is to manage the ISKCON society. He's no longer doing that. He's in a totally artificial bubble world because so many God brothers put him in this big seat and said he should be worshipped as good as God. So, to give you one example, there was a young lady living in Bhagavan's farm, and while Bhagavan is living in the big five-star hotel, this lady can't get diapers for her baby, can't get sanitary napkins for herself, can't get baby formula, things like that. So she's complaining to all the devotees around there, hey, you know, this is a crisis, this is not working. And people just say, well, you know, you have to ask Bhagavan, he's, he's the guru, he's in charge. Well, where is Bhagavan? Oh, he's in the, uh, the five-star hotel in Paris somewhere, and he has really no idea what's going on with the citizens. So all of the devotees who participated in this were helping the problem happen. And in that sense, they were 
beating this poor woman over the head with an iron rod. They were hurting this woman because they were creating a situation where she could not facilitate her baby. So she takes off with the baby, goes to her mother's house in England. Then her husband comes up from Bhagavan's farm with another guy and they, they beat up the mother who's, who has custody of the baby at that time. And they kidnap the baby, take the baby back to France. And then this is in all the newspapers. <laughs> you know, Hare Krishna baby was kidnapped and all this kind of stuff. So then I had to go to Paris, pick up the baby, little little girl, maybe two years old or something, and drive her back to England to bring her back to the mother. And when I go through the customs in England, normally you need paperwork, you need a passport for the baby. But when I came there, they said, oh yeah, that's the baby. We... <laughs> so <laughs> they all knew about the baby. So. That's what happened. It created a big scandal, a big public media newspaper scandal because the citizens of Bhagavan's own were not being cared for. And everyone in the society at that time was co-opted with that process because they weren't helping. They didn't, they didn't see this as a big crisis. They didn't all demand, hey, we got to get rid of Bhagavan. Hey, we got to get rid of Jaitirtha. Hey, we got to get rid of these leaders. We can't allow this. We can't allow our citizens to have no diapers for their babies. And if the, if the uh, GBC, the leaders, are allowing this to happen, they got to go. If you have a, you know, a corporation where people aren't taking care of the workers, then the corporation has to get rid of the uh, directors and get new directors who are going to you know, take care of the workers. But that just doesn't happen in ISKCON because people are co-opted. They're cooperating with the wrong process. So that means they're helping with the beating up of other individuals, like this woman. She's getting beat over the head with an iron pipe, indirectly. She's suffering. Her baby is suffering because everyone's just sitting around and allowing this to happen. So they're facilitating this punishment of other citizens by allowing this to happen. There was another incident where Bhagavan dropped off about 20 couples at the Paris train station without any money or assistance or anything like that. They were just people who didn't think he was a pure devotee. They didn't think he was the guru successor to God, so they were challenging his authority. They had to go. So he just drops them off at the train station with no money. And there was babies with no diapers, with no nothing, same thing. And uh, I had to go down there and give them some money so they could get on the train and come to England. <laughs> at least Jai Tirtha was going to take care of them for the time being. But all kinds of people knew this type thing was going on. It wasn't just an isolated situation. It was a famous story all over Europe at the time that the leaders were just dumping the Prabhupada disciples uh, out of the temples and out on the street with nothing. And Harikesh was doing that, Bhagavan was doing that. Even Jayatirtha was removing people who disagreed. So Ramachar was removing people. Uh, Kirtananda was removing people. Satsarup was removing people. This was all well known by many, many people. This was not like a hidden information. It was well known information. So by 1980, we had the Jayatirtha meltdown where he was taking drugs, sitting in his Vyasasan, yelling, screaming, and the GBC had an emergency meeting in England and they said sometimes pure devotees have problems with drugs. You know, they agreed that he was taking drugs, but they said this is sometimes a symptom found in Acharyas. Acharyas will fall down into taking drugs. By 1980, they had written their paper, The Mahajans Have Difficulties, where they said the Mahajans have problems, and so what to speak of our gurus having problems. So they were trying to compare their problems with the so-called problems of the Mahajans. So this was a big watering down of the status of the Mahajans. 
Then we had the Nubandaban drug mules who were arrested, and from what it appears to have happened, they were using underage girls to put drugs in their underwear and fly around the country uh, with the idea that underage people couldn't really be charged with a felony in case they got caught. <laughs> so uh, that was criminal activity going on. The Laguna Beach Temple was busted for heroin dealing, and that was in all the newspapers. Hansadura's farm was raided by the police. That was in all the newspapers. So uh, devotees were just doing like criminal things. You know, devotees were arrested for wearing Santa suits in Los Angeles. And really the list is kind of endless of all kinds of problems that were going on and were well known by 1980 already. Hansa Duda was in trouble. Ramachar made a letter saying, I'm resigning from the post of guru. We're not qualified to be gurus. It was a big crisis. Bhagavan was creating a big crisis by living like a king. He was called the Sun King. While the citizens were having all kinds of problems getting basic supplies. And Harikesh was kicking out people left, right, and center. And, uh, of course, the, the child molesting issue was starting to grow. You know, Bhavananda was more and more in charge of the children in India. There were reports of problems with that. And, of course, you know, many of these things were in the newspapers. So it's like a lot of devotees would say, we didn't know these problems were going on. Well, how could you not know? But even the police told me in like 1980, they said there was Prabhupada. And then there was the people who thought they were Prabhupada. So even the police understood the problem. So a lot of the devotees went along with all this, or they did not protest sufficiently, or they didn't protest at all, or worse, they tried to block me from protesting. They said, I should not protest. <laughs> you know, I'm offending the senior devotees of ISKCON. So all these things, in my opinion, were just like bashing all kinds of different people over the head with iron rods. It was killing the devotional creepers of all kinds of people. It was killing the image of the movement in the public. The public was getting a very rotten idea of the Krishna religion. And all kinds of things in ISKCON, in and around ISKCON, were just getting beaten up. The people were getting beaten up. The society was getting beaten up. The image was being beaten up. The resources of the society were dwindling because of all the scandals and so on and so forth. So I do believe a lot of the rank and file people were implicated in this by allowing this to happen and by not really protesting. I mean, if you find in the Catholic Church, for example, where there's a molesting problem, 20, 30 molesting victims will go somewhere to some big church and start protesting outside the church. We were victims of this operation, and we're not happy, and then the media will come, and so on and so forth. This really never happened with ISKCON people. We didn't have 20 people out in front of a temple protesting, you know, there's a child molesting problem, there's a drunken guru problem, there's gurus having sex with men, women, and children problem, uh, there's a guru kula problem, they're not taking care of the children. There's just all these problems going on, left, right, center, top, bottom, everywhere, and no real sufficient, let's say, counterpoint to all that going on. And so it just went on and on and on and on. There was no safety net to slow this kind of program down. And the rank and file are, in my opinion, implicated in this by acquiescing, allowing, and facilitating, and enabling these things to go on. Yes, Pranjan, you're right, we know there's a problem, but we are not going to say anything because then we're going to lose our friends. Then we're going to be in trouble with the leaders. Then we won't be able to go to the temple and see our pals over there. Then I won't be able to eat at the temple. I'll lose my room at the temple. I'll lose my salary from the temple. My wife is initiated by a GBC guru. I'll lose my wife. I'll have to sleep on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there was just a lot of compromise with the evildoers program. 
So that, again, is uh, like beating up other people indirectly by allowing. You know, there's a, the crime of o omission as well as the crime of commission. If you allow crimes to go on, then you are implicated in the crimes. So I do think a lot of people were implicated, and that is why I compare this to the destruction of the Guru dynasty. Everyone was getting beaten up in different ways. The leaders were getting beaten up. The rank and file were getting beaten up. The women were getting beaten up. The women were being exploited famously in the so-called women's collection parties. And this was a big scandal going on in the 1980s. A bunch of women were under the charge of some guy like Jiva. And Jiva was having sex with these women. He was beating up these women. Had the same thing going on in Nubandavan. And so on and so forth. And these things were known to a lot of people. And the counteraction was just not happening. But I'll give you some examples. When I uh, was in Santa Cruz one time, I told a devotee about some of the problems going on. And he says, oh, well, Krishna will sort all that out. That's all up to Krishna. He'll deal with that. Just then, his child, five-year-old child, came running through the door. And he had a big dog manure on his shoes. And this guy started yelling at the child. What are you doing running in the house with dog manure? And I said, well, wait a minute. So if somebody runs into Krishna's house with dog manure, that's fine. But if somebody walks into your house with dog manure, it's not fine. So that's what happened to uh, a lot of these people. They were only interested in their own little situation. They were not interested in the society and the problems of the society and the implication of worshiping bogus people in the society. Now, some people said, well, we didn't know about all the uh, child abuse going on. Well, maybe not, but you did know that the children were worshiping these fools as their gurus. That itself is child abuse. If you have your children worshiping fools as their messiahs, you are abusing your children just right out of the gate. <laughs> I mean, you can't avoid that point. It's your responsibility to make sure your children are worshiping the proper people as their messiahs, and you are not doing that. Therefore, you are causing problems for your children. But people just didn't get it. They didn't think that was a big issue. You know, yeah, who, who cares what who my children are worshiping? Who cares uh, who is being offered the boga? Who cares if conditioned souls are being advertised as people who can absorb sins when it's clear that they can't absorb sins. Well, who cares? Well, okay, but if you don't care, and then no one else cares, <laughs> then the problem will just have to be settled by uh, the outside forces, which is what happened. The police came and raided these places. The FBI came and raided these places. The media made one big scandal story after another and exposed what was going on. And the courts uh, had to deal with your child molesting problem and this problem and that problem and, and the other problem. So it had to be handled by external force. You were forced to agree and accept that these things are deviations. You were forced by the outside authorities. So how did that happen? Again, arrogance. Arrogance. People thought, oh, these material people are just demons and they're fools and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, but wait a minute. The demons, <laughs> you know, the police, you know, the media, the courts, those are the demons, supposedly. And those are the people who are having to sort you out. You have to be corrected by the demons, then, what's, then what is your position? So this is what uh, I've been up against, really, you know, trying to sort out the problems in the ISKCON Krishna society. You know, I have to get alliances with the outside people. I have to be allied with the police, with the FBI, with the media, with the courts. They're going to help me because the so-called devotees are not, by and large. This has been the problem. Now that is turning around gradually. More and more people are coming around and saying, oh yeah, there's a problem. We've got to deal with this problem. But it's taken quite a long time and it's kind of like you have to go to the bottom of the barrel before you can start climbing out of the barrel, <laughs> I suppose. So we really had to get to a very low point in things, you know, before we could start to sort these things out. So what happened 
to the Yadu dynasty was the leaders, the rank and file, all of the members were destroyed. Everyone suffered equally because of collective arrogance. So that is also what has happened in ISKCON. The leaders are suffering. They're falling down, they're getting sick, they're getting headaches, they have to take a bunch of pills, they have to get surgeries, <laughs> they have to go to psychics to find out what's wrong with uh, their health, they're fainting, they're going to the hospital, they're dying, and so many things are happening to the leaders. And then the rank and file are also suffering in so many ways because the society that they wanted to participate in is being dismantled in so many ways. So the rank and file are suffering, the leaders are suffering, and that is also what happened in the Yadu dynasty. The leaders, the followers, everyone collectively was uh, destroyed in the end. And the reason was arrogance. Arrogance is what killed them. They thought, we are God's uh, you know, agents on earth. We can do what we want. We can sit in a big Vyasasan seat if we want to. We can rob banks. We can have these woman collecting party <laughs> things going on. We can send uh, young girls around uh, with drugs. We can sell heroin. You know, we can just do whatever we want to do because we're the agents of God on earth. We are authorized and we can kill dissenters. We can ban devotees, beat devotees, kill devotees. We can do what we want. We're authorized. We have God's authority. So that's very, uh, you know, symptomatic of arrogant people. It's, it's really very simple. It's not hard to figure out. And, uh, and we've had other uh, people, even so-called reformers, who are opposed to us. And one of them is uh, the HKC Jaipur folks. And they, uh, their group started a petition, let's remove Pod from the internet. Yes, we have to remove anyone who objects to child molesters sitting in Vyasasan seats being worshipped as good as God it has to be removed from the internet. And what do we want to keep on the internet? Oh, we want to keep Bhaktadas, who's a big defender of the GBC Guru program. So we got to remove those who object to the mad kings posing as messiahs. And we keep the people who support the mad kings posing as messiahs. And that is the whole problem right there. We have a lot of sympathy for the evildoers. And many of my god brothers are the same way. They, they wanted to remove me, stop me, block me, remove my uh, publications, rip up my publications, get rid of my publications, and silence me. And silence Sulokshan and silence some of the other people dissenting. And this is the result. The result is the Yadu dynasty was destroyed and they were, their society was destroyed in a similar way. So anyway, I hope this has helped some people understand things. Um, I do, again, blame mainly the leaders. Just like in the mafia, it's the mob leader that's the main cause of trouble. The bank robber who works for the mob leader is He's a bad guy, but he's not as bad <laughs> as the mob leader. So the mob leader gets the bigger jail sentence than the bank robber who works for the leader. So I, that's what will happen. You know, these people who pose as gurus will go to the most obnoxious regions of the universe. That's what Shastra says. People who pose as gurus are officially are destined to go to the most obnoxious regions. Their helpers will also have to suffer in different ways, and uh, but they won't suffer as bad as the leaders. So it's like that. And then there's a lot of people I consider more or less innocent. They just went along because they pretty much had to. They just didn't have the wherewithal to battle the forces that were going on. So they just kind of got sucked into this thing 
But Krishna knows all that. Krishna knows who are the evil players. He knows who are the, you know, less evil players, and he knows who are the innocent, less innocent, more innocent, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it will all get sorted out by Krishna over time, and it is getting sorted out over time. So anyway, I feel like this is a good example that Krishna gave us. The, the Yadur dynasty was destroyed by arrogance, and if we become arrogant, we will also be destroyed in the same way. It's just history will repeat.